It's May 8th, 1993, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. If you were a passenger on New York City's A train at about 4 p.m. today in history in 1993, well, you probably wouldn't notice anything. There was nothing unusual about your journey, passing through the Upper West Side, Harlem, Brooklyn, the Bronx, hitting every station bang on time. You'd certainly have no cause to suspect your driver was a 16-year-old imposter living out his fantasy of driving a train and doing it quite well. Yeah, well, you wouldn't notice until the moment where Kieran Thomas, the 16-year-old in question, accidentally went a bit too fast around a bend and triggered the train's emergency brake, which brought the whole low-stakes heist to a premature close because under transit authority procedures, if any train does that and the emergency brake goes on, then the operator has to be taken to headquarters in Brooklyn for immediate urinalysis and a breathalyzer test. Okay, let's talk about who Kieran Thomas was and how he ended up driving this train. So he's He's 16 years old, as we've said. He's originally from Trinidad, where, note, there are no trains, basically. So he then moved with his family to New York and became obsessed with trains. Uh, in this sort of charming adolescent way, because he was 13 when he started this interest, nerdy kid, you know, he hung transit authority posters in his bedroom. Literally his favourite book was the rules and regulations governing employees engaged in the operation of New York City Transit System Manual. I mean, um, it's a good one. I also <laughs> love <classic>. that. <laughs> uh, so he, he would pretend play at being what they call a motorman on the New York subway. But then his interests started to escalate. Yeah, as time went on, the obsession started to spill out into real life. First, he would spend loads of time hanging around at stations to spend time around the motormen. And then in December 1992, he was caught trespassing in a rail yard, but he was released without charge because it was obviously very clear that it was harmless. He wasn't intending train to spot it. He just, mm. Yeah, he just wanted to be closer. Which is, I mean, and the thing is, a lot of people who work in the trains loved trains when they were kids. So this habit was superficially endearing, but it was his presence at rail yards and rail stations, including the 207th Street Depot, which is a terminus where drivers would clock on and off. This inadvertently allowed him to pick up a lot of information about the crews, including a guy called Regoberto Sabio, who was a motorman, who he talked to loads of times. And he had this like motorman's shirt that he would wear all the time to the point that some of his neighbours thought that he actually worked on the New York City transit system. And so he would hang around wearing it. And this Regoberto Sabio assumed that he was, you know, a fellow employee and they would just chit chat about this and that. And Kieran Thomas knew all of the slang. He knew everything about the systems and how they work. So he could easily pass for an employee, which led to the point where on this day, knowing Sabio's shift patterns from their conversations, he was able to ring up the depot and ask, you know, he'd say, hey, it's me, Regoberto Sabio. Do you need me to come in and pick up any shifts today? And they said, yeah, sure, come on down. So he turned up wearing his uniform shirt and he was carrying with him a set of standard issue items that any New York City motorman would carry. Safety vest, a reverser key, which is like the handle that changes the train's direction. And his appearance was obviously convincing enough that from what I could read, he wasn't directly ever asked to show his ID, although he did, they suspect, have a fake one on him. But it seemed like he wasn't even asked to show it. Yeah, and Albert W. O'Leary, who was a spokesperson for the train, Transit police said, it's not like getting behind the wheel of a Chevy and pulling away from the curb. He came almost fully equipped. You know the old saying, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a motorman. So, you know, he actually had enough on him that people were like, yeah, put him on the train, let him do his job. I mean, I think the words he was looking for were, sorry, we let him drive this train without showing his like, <laughs> That would have been a better statement. Yeah. <laughs> He'd been watching Sabio for months and months and months, seeing how he pulled in and out of each stop, witnessing how you crank each you know, shaft and how you make each announcement so that he came across as completely convincing, nearly flawless on a 47-mile trip. I mean, it's worth saying the train that he ended up piloting, the A-train, is the largest uh, track in all of New York. It is, it's the A train, right? It goes for ages. He made 85 stops. The Washington Post says that you can tell he was a subway connoisseur due to the choice of train that he hijacked. <laughs> the longest and most glamorous of them all, running from the tip of Upper Manhattan to the outermost of Queens. And this was the case with a lot of the reporting which got caught up in the romance of the story of this kid who, at the end of the day, wasn't doing anything malevolent. He wasn't a terrorist. He wasn't 
wasn't trying to scare or, or, you know, or intimidate anyone. He was actually just living his fantasy. And I think that meant that he got a lot of kind of uh, kind handling because even when uh, authorities came to pick him up, people still didn't suspect that he was an imposter. And it was only when Thomas ran away from his escorts that, that they realised that they'd been had. And then, because he'd run away, they had to actually do this sort of investigation to work out who it was who had done this thing. Yeah, it's kind of a shame. Why am I saying it's a shame? We're all taken it's away with his incredible uh, <laughs> audaciousness. But it is kind of a shame because he'd, he'd only exceeded the 20 mile an hour speed limit slightly as well. It wasn't really dangerous for the passengers. It just tripped this automatic control. And so in a way, the mistake that he made was not going too fast. The mistake mm. that he made was running away from the inspector. If he'd have done the blood and urine tests, then all that would have happened is that Regoberto Sabio would have received some overtime <laughs> for work that he did when he was on holiday without knowing about it uh, and had a clean drug test for a minor, you know, infringement. Yeah, so the crimes were felonious reckless endangerment and two misdemeanours, criminal impersonation and second degree forgery for his possessing of a fake uh, transit identification card. Look, as far as anyone knows, this was the first time that Thomas had ever done this, but we don't know. You know, the, the last thing he would do is say to anyone involved that he'd, uh, he'd, you know, done it before and he'd got away with it. He avoided jail because they accepted his story that he'd just been a big fan of locomotives obsessively for his entire life. And so instead of getting any sort of prison time, he ended up being given three years of probation for reduced misdemeanor charges. And so he got a slap on the wrist rather than anything else. With the great support of New Yorkers who'd acclaimed him as a kind of folk hero, I do think the fact this was 1993, pre-9-11, puts a very different colour on this mm. particular mm. <laughs> adventure, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean... He'd probably be shot dead after 9-11, wouldn't he? They found out a man of colour yeah. just taken a train and taken 2,000 people around New York with a fake identity. That would be curtains. But in mm. 1993, local news also kind of taking his side from the point of view of, I suppose, poverty, really, and saying, I saw a report that said, if only he'd lived in the suburbs, he'd have found an outlet because um, he could have volunteered to drive steam trains. But mm. because he lived in the... Is that something that kids in the suburbs right. do? <laughs> Apparently. I lived but, in the wrong suburbs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, be part of a hobbyist club or something. But because he lives in inner city New York, for him, this was all there is. And I was thinking, he likes trains. He can get on a train and go to the suburbs, surely. Like, it's not, it's not all there is to hijack a subway train with thousands of people on it. <laughs> I mean, the press at the time was definitely behind yeah. his aspirations broadly. You know, the reports from the time really made much of the fact that because he had been sentenced as a youth offender, his record would be scrubbed clean when he turned 18, which meant that it, it wouldn't bar him from future employment with the New York Transit Authority. You know, they were really behind the idea that he would go on and drive trains. And actually, outside court, because there were reporters, you know, covering this story, it had really captured the imagination of the city. He told them that he was undeterred in his dream of becoming a train driver. At school, he got the nickname A-Train, which must have been so satisfying. <laughs> but five years later, the New York Times ran this Where Are They Now type piece and they found him. He was a 22-year-old trainee electrician who actually had just given up on his training. It's kind of sad, really. He, he basically described that his obsession had waned after he pulled this off. This was sort of the culmination of it. He said, um, at that point in time, that was just my goal, just to get behind this train. I never really think about it anymore. And as it turned out, he was right to seize every opportunity that came his way because he died in 2013, aged just 37, uh, from heart failure. And his death was marked with obituaries as a sort of significant local public figure in the place where he lived because of this one afternoon breaking the rules in 1993. But I mean, it turns out he wasn't the first person to pull this stunt and he wasn't even the first person to pull this stunt on the New York City transit system specifically. There's this guy, Darius McCollum, who's definitely a subject for future retrospectors, an infamous repeat imposter who's posed as a New York City bus driver, subway driver, light rail driver. Uh, he was first arrested aged 15 in 1980 after driving an E-train several stops. Like Thomas, you know, he managed to do it quite well. Um, he repeatedly, though, managed to keep infiltrating and driving trains. He even attended union meetings for, <laughs> for the employees. He's been arrested over 30 times and spent most of his adult life in prison. He's got, you know, it's like a real addiction. In a way, why not have a driver who's obsessed with trains? And I mean, you know, 
the general passenger isn't concerned whether or not their driver's in the union, are they? The general passenger is concerned about getting there safely. And actually, someone who's really paying attention, who's absolutely loving it, probably is a better driver. <laughs> You'd probably rather that they weren't under the age of, like, 18 yes, and had actually gone through the driver training and weren't in the business of taking corners a bit too quickly, though. <laughs> Next, they'll be saying they need professionally qualified historians to do history podcasts. I know, it's wild. Right. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. Puppet can't slap a policeman with a sausage with the same type of relish you can get with your hands, you know. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAS Creator Network.